By nightfall, we had completed what we later learned to call the priority supply of this frontline section. Nothing had happened since the bombardment of the afternoon, and the unfortunate soldiers on the dawn were preparing themselves for another icy night. Although the temperature had risen a little, it was still very cold. We were waiting for two of our men who were collecting the scattering of letters these soldiers had managed to write. Hals, another soldier and I were sitting on a mound of frost-hardened earth, hidden from enemy eyes. I wonder where we'll be sleeping tonight, said Hals, staring at his boots. Outdoors, I guess, our companion answered. I don't see any hotels around here. Come over this way, called someone else from our group. You can see the river very well from here. We got up from the ground to look through a heap of frosty branches that camouflaged a spandau aimed and ready to fire. Look, Hal said, bodies lying on the ice. There were numbers of motionless bodies, victims of the fighting of a few days earlier. The soldiers at the Geshnaus had not been exaggerating. The Russians had not removed their dead. I tried to see further into the distance, to what must be the island we had heard so much about, but this was difficult. As it was growing dark, I could recognize only vaguely what looked like snow-covered trees. Our soldiers must be crouched among them, watching in the silence with every sense alert. Beyond, in the heavy, unbreathable mist falling across this mournful landscape, the far bank was almost invisible. On this bank, the German advance had been halted, and Russian soldiers were watching for us. I had reached the front line, the line I had thought about with such dread and had been so curious to see. For the moment, nothing was happening. The silence was almost complete, broken only by occasional voices. I thought I could see a few thin streams of smoke rising through the mist on the Russian side. Then some other soldiers pushed me aside. If it interests you so much, said one of the grenadiers standing at the foot of the Spandau, till gladly give you my place. I've had enough of this cold. We didn't know what to say. His place was certainly not very enviable. A lieutenant in a long hooded coat jumped into our hole. Before we had time to salute, he lifted a pair of field glasses and stared into the distance. A few seconds later, we heard the sound of heavy detonations coming from behind us. Almost at once there were explosions on the ice, immediately reproduced by a long, repetitive echo, and then a sharp whistling sound which rang through the air very close to us. The entire German front responded immediately. The noise of the guns became indistinguishable from the explosion of their projectiles. We all dropped to the bottom of the hole. We felt lost and stared at each other with anguished, questioning ease. They're attacking, someone said. The two machine gunners didn't fire right away, but stayed beside the lieutenant, staring at the dawn. Some of the explosions were loud and strident. Others sounded heavy and as if they were coming from underground. Finally, the grenadier who had so generously offered his place decided to speak to us. The ice is breaking more easily tonight. It's not so cold. Pretty soon, they'll have to swim over. We all hung on his words, as none of us understood what was happening. We'll send out the lightest one here, he said. If the ice holds his weight, we'll have to blow it up. He's the lightest, said Flaws with a constricted laugh, pointing to a cringing, very young soldier. What will I have to do? the boy asked, white with anxiety. Nothing just yet, the gunner said jokingly. The bombardment stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The lieutenant looked out through his glasses for a few more minutes, then climbed over the parapet and vanished. We stayed where we were, without moving or speaking. To break the anxious silence, our sergeant ordered us to open our mess tins and eat dinner while we waited for the fellows with the mail. We swallowed down our tasteless, frozen portions without much appetite. As I chew it, I went over to the Spandau to look down once more at the river. What I saw explained the German bombardment of a few moments ago. Great blocks of ice, some of them two feet thick, were standing up at right angles to the surface of the river. These ice blocks, partly broken and crushed, formed steep hills of ice, whose crests oscillated with the rhythm of the current beneath the frozen surface. The German gunners fired on the ice every night to deny access to the incessant Soviet patrols, who nonetheless exposed themselves to great danger on these moving blocks. 
Now the broken ice was rearing up and crashing into other pieces with a strange, heavy sound. New fissures were opening, and the night was filled with the noises of cracking, breaking ice. I stood for a long time, transfixed by the unreal vision, gradually noticing that hundreds of lights were springing up on the east bank. With my eye glued to the loophole, I stared at these lights, which seemed to be growing stronger. Hey! I shouted at the two regulars. Something's happening. They rushed over to me, pushing me aside so they could see. I stayed where I was, shoving my head between theirs. Hell, you really scared us, one of them said. That's nothing. They do it every night. The pop-offs like to make us think they're warming up. Not at all a bad idea, either. Those lights are a damn nuisance. Look how hard it is to see the river now. Even flares make it hard. I couldn't tear myself away from this disquieting vision. All along the vast horizon, the Russians had lit hundreds of braziers, not to warm themselves, because they must certainly have kept their distance from them, but to dazzle our observers. And in fact, when the eye traveled to the east bank, it remained fixed on those fires. Everything else, by contrast, was plunged into darkness, and this enabled the enemy to effect numerous changes, which we could deduce only with difficulty. We were able to see a little with flares, but their radiance, although intense, was reduced at least to half strength by the enemy's arrangement of alternating light and darkness. I would have stood and stared much longer if our sergeant hadn't given the signal for departure. We had no trouble returning to the rear. The night, undisturbed by the noises of war, hid our movements perfectly. Everywhere, soldiers were curled up in their holes. Those who were asleep had covered themselves with everything they could find, leaving no fraction of themselves exposed, not a nose or the tip of an ear. One needed to be accustomed to this strange mode of existence to know that beneath these mounds of cloth, subtle human mechanisms were managing to survive and gamer their strength. Others were playing cards in the depths of their lairs, or writing letters in the flickering light of a candle, or of a lamp heater. These marvelous objects, and I call them marvelous deliberately, were about two feet high and would operate on gasoline or kerosene. One simply had to regulate the nozzle and the intake of air. A reflector behind a glass projected the light. A story had it that the army was working on an improved model, which would also dispense beer. Those who were neither asleep on guard playing cards or writing letters were absorbing the alcohol which was freely distributed along with our ammunition. There's as much vodka, schnapps, and teric liquor on the front as there are packs, I was told later by a wounded infantryman who was waiting for evacuation on the hospital train. It's the easiest way to make heroes. Vodka purges the brain and expands the strength. I've been doing nothing but drink for two days now. It's the best way to forget that I've got seven pieces of metal in my gut, if you can believe the doctor. We got back to our two sleighs without incident. Am I dreaming, Hal said, or has it grown warmer? I'm sweating like an ox in these clothes. Maybe I've got a fever. That's all I need. Then I've got one too, I said. I'm soaking wet. That's because you had the ball scared off you today, said the fellow who earlier in the afternoon had shouted. They'll kill me. Listen to who's talking, Hal said. You're still as green as your clothes and you think you can judge us. Our slaves were now carrying six wounded as well as ourselves. Although they were less heavily loaded than they had been, they ran less smoothly. The little horses were clearly having a hard time. We could almost see the snow growing softer as we looked at it. The wind was carrying large flakes of melting snow, which soon changed to rain. This milder air, after such terrible cold, seemed to us like the Côte d'Azur. It took us two hours to reach our huts in the rear lines, and we needed no urging to fling ourselves onto our rough pallets. However, despite the physical and emotional exhaustion of that wearing day, I wasn't able to sleep immediately. I kept seeing the banks of the dawn and hearing the whine of enemy projectiles and the explosions, whose violence I would never have been able to imagine. For me, whose eardrums were shattered by the firing of a Mauser, our Polish exercises now seemed like the most trifling of games. The infantry on the west bank had to fight as well as survive. That was the difference between them and us. We had been promised that we would be as honored as the infantry, as combat troops, if we distinguished ourselves on our supply missions. 
This promise, which had been made to us on behalf of our commander at the Wagenlager near Minsk, was clearly addressed to young recruits like Hals, Lenzen, Olensheim, and me. We had taken it as an honor, and were proud of the confidence which had been placed in us. Yet the reports in the frontline journal blamed us squarely, almost making us responsible for the German retreat from the Caucasus and back beyond Rostov. For lack of supplies, these troops had been forced to abandon territories won with great sacrifices, so that they would not suffer the same fate as the defenders of Stalingrad. In their exhortations to us, our officers often asked us to achieve a certain goal, despite adverse conditions at whatever the cost, to do more than was humanly possible to face the prospect of the worst, including death. We had thought that we had accomplished more than the bare minimum. In fact, despite our unstinted efforts and all our bitter moments, we had achieved somewhat less than half of what had been expected. Maybe we should have given our lives too. Absolute sacrifice was what the high command called it. These words made my head spin as I stared with wide eyes into the impenetrable darkness, sinking gradually into sleep as into a large black pit. Ernst Neubach, my new friend, seemed to be a born engineer. He had no equal in his ability to knock a few old boards into a shelter as weatherproof as one a fully equipped mason might build. He made a shower from the gas tank of a large tractor, and it functioned miraculously, with a lamp heater continuously warming its 40 gallons of water. The first men to use this shower unfortunately received a tepid downpour of water flavored with gasoline. Although we rinsed the tank repeatedly, the water remained tainted for a long time. In the evenings waiting to use the shower there was always a crowd of shouting, pushing men which often included our superiors. Priority was awarded to whoever produced the largest number of cigarettes or a portion of the bread ration. Our Feldwebel Laus once paid 300 cigarettes. The showers always began after the five o'clock meal and continued late into the night in an atmosphere of rowdy horseplay. Those who got through the showers first often found themselves tossed onto their backsides in the liquid mud which flooded the outskirts of the camp. Here we had no curfew or other barracks regulations. Once all the day's work was done, we were free to jokey and drink for the whole night, if we wanted to. We spent about a week in this way, with quiet, uneventful days. Each fatigue party obliged us to flounder through a sea of increasingly sticky mud. We made three trips back to the front. Each time it was unbelievably quiet. On horseback or in carts we took supplies to our troops, whose laundry was spread out to dry on all the parapets. Across the dawn, the Russians appeared to be similarly engaged. We spoke to a bearded soldier and asked him if everything was going well. He laughed. The war must be over. Hitler and Stalin have made it up. I've never seen it so calm for so long. The Popovs do nothing but drink all day and sing all night. They have terrific nerve, too, walking around in the open air, right under our guns. Work saw three of them going to get water from the river, just like that. Didn't you work? He turned to a sly-faced soldier who was washing his feet in a puddle. Yes, Verk said. We just couldn't shoot them. For once, let's all stick our noses out without getting a bullet between the eyes. A feeling of joy and hope had begun to take hold. Could the war be over? 92. It really might be, Halls said. The fellows on the front are always the last to be told anything like that. If it's true, we'll know in a few days. You'll see, sire. Maybe we'll all be going home soon. We'll have a terrific celebration. It's almost too good to be true. Don't count your chickens before they're hatched, said one of the older men from the Rollbahn. His realism damped us down a little. As usual, we set off down the track, more accurately, canal, of liquid mud, which led to our camp. We stopped a moment to talk to Ernst, whose section was trying to restore the track to a usable condition. If it goes on this way, he said, we'll have to take to boats. Two trucks came through here, and the stones we broke our backs shoving into the mud completely disappeared. It must be nice down in the trenches. They're in a mess, Hall said, and their morale is really terrible, too. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they broke up their guns for kindling. Our fellows and the Popovs are having a real spree down there. Well, let them make the most of it, Ernst said. There's something funny going on.
That radio truck over there is taking messages non-stop. And messengers all the time, too. The last one had to leave his scooter and wade in here to bring the commandant his message. Maybe it was congratulations for your showers, said Halls. That would be fine by me, but I doubt it. When those fellows run around like that, everybody else will too, before you know it. Defeatist, Halls shouted as we left. When we got back to the camp, nothing seemed to have changed. We devoured the steaming mess the cook served up and prepared for another evening of larking. Then Laos blew the whistle for assembly. Lord, I thought, Nubak was right. Here we go again. I'm not going to say anything about the way you look, Lao said. Just pack up. We could be moving out of here any time now, got it? Fuck, someone said. It was too good to last. You didn't think you could just sit here and fart, did you? There's a war on. Packing up meant that we had to be ready for inspection, with our uniforms in impeccable order and all our straps and buckles polished and fastened in the prescribed manner. At least, that is what it had meant at Chemnitz and Bialystok. Here, of course, that kind of discipline was somewhat relaxed, but it all still depended on the humor of the inspecting officer, who could quibble at anything from the inside of a gun barrel to the state of our toes, and impose heavy details or endless guard duty. I could still remember only too well the four hours of punishment handed out to me a few days after I had arrived at Chemnitz. The lieutenant had drawn a circle on the cement of the courtyard, which was fully exposed to the sun. Then I had to put on the punishment pack, a knapsack filled with sand, which weighed nearly 80 pounds. I weighed 130. After two hours, my helmet was burning hot from the sun, and by the end I needed all my willpower to keep my knees from buckling. I had nearly fainted several times. That is how I learned that a good soldier does not cross the barracks yard with his hands in his pockets. So we rushed to get our gear in order, and frantically polished our sodden leather boots. And before we've walked ten yards, all this will be for nothing. It took us a good hour to make our kit more or less respectable. Then we had another twenty-four before our country holiday on the dawn was transformed into a nightmare. The day after our sprucing up, I was put on guard duty and given the period from midnight until 2.30 a.m. I had summoned up all my patients and was standing on the platform of empty munitions cases which had been put there so the sentry wouldn't sink into the mud. Beside the platform, a foxhole half filled with water was ready to receive the guard responsible for the stocks of gasoline, in this case, myself. The night was mild. A rainy wind blew fat white clouds rapidly across the sky, occasionally revealing a large white moon. To my right, the outlines of our vehicles and the camp buildings stood out sharply. Ahead of me, the enormous dark, hilly horizon melted into the sky. As the crow flies, the dawn lay about five miles from our first line of German reserves. Between us and the river, some thousands of men were sleeping in conditions of almost unimaginable squalor. The sound of engines came to us on the wind. Both sides used the dark for moving supplies and troops. Two of the sentries patrolling our perimeter came by, and we exchanged the usual formalities. One of the men told a joke. I was about to reply when the whole horizon from north to south was suddenly lit by a series of brilliant flashes. Then there was a second series of flickering intensity, and I thought I felt the earth shake, as the air filled with a sound like thunder. Lord, it's an attack, shouted one of the men on patrol. I think it's them. We could already hear whistles in the camp and voices shouting orders through the still distant noise of explosions. Groups of men went by on the run. Artillerymen who had been asleep were running to their guns on the edge of the abandoned airfield. As no one had told me to leave my post, I stayed where I was, wondering what would be asked of my comrades. A supply expedition through such a heavy bombardment would be an operation of an entirely different kind from the ones we had recently grown used to. The bursts of distant fire continued, mixed with the sound of our guns. Flashes of light, closer and more brilliant than before, turned the groups of men running through pools of water into shadow puppets. It was as if a giant, in a fit of terrible fury, were shaking the universe, reducing each man to a ludicrous fragment which the colossus of war could trample without even noticing. Despite the relative distance of danger, I bent double, ready to plunge into my water-filled hole at a moment's notice. Two big crawler tractors came toward me, with all their lights out, 
their wheels and treads had churned the mud into a kind of liquid sludge. Two men jumped down and almost disappeared in it. Give us a hand guard, one of them called. They were splattered with mud right up to their helmets. The bombardment continued to inflame the earth and sky as we loaded some drums of gasoline onto their machine. There's always something to fart in your face, one of them said to me. Good luck, I answered. Further off, the soldiers in my unit were rounding up the nervous, jostling horses, which kept falling in the mud and whinnying frantically. Several times, trucks came to collect drums of gasoline, so that by daybreak, when my relief hadn't appeared, I wondered how much there was left for me to guard. The bombardment was almost as strong as ever. I felt exhausted and confused. A group of boys from my company came by, led by a sergeant who waved me over to join them. At that moment precisely, one of the first Soviet long-range shells landed about a hundred yards behind us. The explosion shook us, and we all started to run as hard as we could. I didn't ask any questions, but looked in vain for the broad shoulders of Halls. Other projectiles were now falling on the camp, which was lit up everywhere. We had thrown ourselves onto the ground, and stood up again covered with mud. Um. Don't dive like that, said the sergeant. You're always late. Keep your eye on me and do what I do. A significant howl filled our ears, and all twelve of us, the sergeant included, plunged into the liquid mess. An enormous explosion sucked all the air from our lungs, and a simultaneous wave of mud washed over us. We stood up again, soaked with filth, and wearing the pinched smiles of civilians who climb unscathed from a bad wreck. Three or four more bursts quite nearby forced us down again. Behind us, something was burning. As soon as we could, we ran to the nearest munitions dump. The sight of this mountain of canvas-covered boxes made our stomachs turn over. If anything hit it, no one within a hundred yards would have a chance. Good God, said the sergeant. There's nobody here. It's incredible. With no apparent thought of danger, he climbed onto the hill of dynamite and began to check the numbers on the boxes, which indicated their next destination. We stood and watched him petrified, like condemned prisoners, with our feet apart and our heads empty, waiting for orders. Two fellows soaked through like us came running up. The sergeant began to shout at them from his eminence. They snapped to attention despite the thunder of the guns. Are you supposed to be on duty here? Yes, Herr Sergeant, they answered in unison. Then where were you? The call of nature, one of them said. You went off to crap like that, both of you at once. Idiots. We've got too much trouble here for fun and games. Your names and units. The sergeant had not climbed down. Silently, I cursed this animal with his niggling discipline, who stood there preparing a report, as if nothing unusual were happening. Fresh explosions which sounded very close threw us all onto the ground except the sergeant, who continued to provoke Providence. They're cleaning up our rear, he said. They must have let loose their goddamned infantry. Get your fat tails up here and help me. Half paralyzed by fear, we climbed onto the volcano. The flashes of light all around us lit our bodies in a tragic glare. A few moments later, we were running as hard as we could, oblivious of the weight of the cases and our anxiety to get away. Daylight had now begun to rob the spectacle of some of its brilliance. The flashes of light were scarcely visible, and the horizon was shrouded by a dense cloud of smoke, irregularly punctuated by darker plumes. Toward noon, our artillery began to fire. We were still running from job to job, although we were nearly dropping with exhaustion. I can remember sitting in a huge crater which had been dried out by an explosion, staring at the long barrel of a 155 spitting fire with rhythmic regularity. I had found Hals and Lenson, and we were sitting together, with our hands over our ears. Hals was smiling and nodding at each explosion. For two days we had practically no sleep. The dance of death continued. We were carrying the growing number of wounded to shelters half filled with water and laying them on hastily improvised stretchers made of branches. The orderlies administered first aid. Soon these rough infirmaries, filled with the groans of the wounded, were overflowing, and we had to put fresh casualties outside, on the mud. The surgeons operated on the dying men then and there. I saw horrifying things at these collection points, vaguely human trunks, which seemed to be made of blood and mud. On the morning of the third day, the battle intensified. We were all gray with fatigue. 
The shelling went on until dusk, and then, inside of an hour, stopped. Clouds of smoke were rising all along the battered front. We felt as if we could smell the presence of death, and by this I don't mean the process of decomposition, but the smell that emanates from death when its proportions have reached a certain magnitude. Anyone who has been on a battlefield will know what I mean. Two of the eight huts that made up our camp had been reduced to ashes. The ones that remained standing were overflowing with wounded. Laos, who had a good heart when the chips were down, saw that we were foundering and allowed us each an hour or two of sleep, as he could. We dropped to the ground wherever we were, as if felled by sleep. When our time was up and we were shaken awake, we felt as though we'd only been asleep for a few minutes. With exhaustion threatening to overwhelm us again, we returned to the nightmare of carrying agonized, mutilated men, or laying out rows of horribly burned bodies, which we had to search for their identity tags. These were then sent to the families of the deceased with the citation, fallen like a hero on the field of honor for Germany and for the Fuhrer. Despite the thousands of dead and wounded, the last battle fought by the German army on the dawn was celebrated the day after the shooting stopped. The mouths of dying men were pried open so that they could toast this Pyrrhic victory with vodka. On a front, approximately 40 miles long, General Zhukov, with the help of the accursed Siberia army, which had just contributed, to the German defeat at Stalingrad had been trying to break the Don line south of Voronezh. Instead, the furious Russian assaults had broken against our solidly held lines. Thousands of Soviet soldiers had paid with their lives for this abortive effort which had also cost us very dear. Three quarters of my company left that evening. The trucks were jammed with wounded, who were lying almost in piles. I was separated from Howells and Lenzen for the moment, a separation I never liked. Friendships counted for a great deal during the war, their value perhaps increased by the generalized hate, consolidating men on the same side and friendships which never would have broken through the barriers of ordinary peacetime life. I found myself alone with a couple, of men who may have been more or less interesting but with whom I never had the chance to talk. As soon as I could, I abandoned them for a truck seat, on which I attempted to regain some of my strength. The assembly whistle rang in my ears very early the next morning. I opened my eyes. The truck cab had made an excellent bed, more or less the right size, and I felt at last as though I'd had some sleep. But exhaustion had stiffened my muscles and despite my sleep I had a terrible time pulling myself onto my feet. Lining up outside, I saw the same exhausted, disheveled look on almost every face. Even Laos wasn't feeling particularly energetic. He had slept with his equipment like all the rest of us. He told us that we were going to leave this area for a point farther west. As a preliminary, we should stand by to help the engineers load up or destroy what we weren't taking with us. We filed past a big kettle from which we were served a hot liquid that made no pretense to being coffee and went to join the engineers. We were sent out with donkeys under orders to range widely, picking up all the ammunition we could find so that it wouldn't fall into the hands of the enemy. The departure seemed to be general. Long lines of infantry caked with filth were marching away from this sea of mud to the west. At first we thought we were being replaced, but this proved to be untrue. The entire Wehrmacht along the western bank of the Don had been ordered to withdraw. We couldn't grasp the logic of following a heroic three-day resistance with retreat. Most of us were unaware that the Eastern Front had entirely changed since January. After the fall of Stalingrad, a strong Soviet push had reached the outskirts of Kharkov, recrossed the Donets, and moved on to Rostov, almost cutting the German retreat from the Caucasus. Troops there had been forced to return to the Crimea by way of the Sea of Azov, with heavy losses. Our periodical Ostfront and Panzer Wolfram reported that there had been heavy fighting at Kharkov, Kuban, and even Anapa. We never heard a frank admission of retreat, and as most soldiers had never studied Russian geography, we had very little idea of what was happening. Nevertheless, a glance at any map was enough to inform us that the west bank of the Don was the easternmost German line in Russian territory. Luckily for us, the high command ordered our retreat before an encirclement from the north and south could cut us off from our bases at Belgorod and Kharkov. The Don was no longer one of our defenses. It had been crossed both in the north 
and in the South. The thought that we might have been trapped, like the defenders of Stalingrad, still makes my blood man cold. For two days, the Lanzersas infantry had been pulling out, either on foot or loaded in trucks. Soon only a small section of the Panzergruppe was left at the nearly empty camp. The passage of vehicles and men had turned the Luftwaffe field into an extraordinary quagmire. Thousands of trucks, tanks, tractors, and men rolled and tramped for two days and two nights through terrain running with streams of mud. We were in the middle of this syrup, trying to reorganize the material we had to abandon. The engineers were working with us, preparing to dynamite the ammunition we had heaped against the huts over the carcasses of eight dismantled trucks. Toward noon, we organized a fireworks display which any municipality might have envied. Carts, sleighs, and buildings were all dynamited and burned. Two heavy howitzers, which the tractors hadn't been able to pull from the mire, were loaded with shells of any caliber. Then, we poured any explosive that came to hand into their tubes and shut the breach as best we could. The howitzers were split in two by the explosions scattering showers of lethal shrapnel. We felt exhilarated, filled with the spirit of destructive delight. In the evening, the Spandau stopped a few Soviet patrols, who had undoubtedly come to see what was happening. During our last hour, we were under light artillery fire, which caused us a certain emotion. Then we left. After the period of light artillery fire, the troops covering the Panzergruppe signaled several enemy penetrations into our former positions. A hasty departure order was given. We were no longer organized to hold off the Russians for any length of time. I was carrying my belongings looking for a vehicle when our Feld assigned me to a truck we had captured from the enemy, which was now carrying our wounded. Step on the gas, he shouted. We're getting out. Every soldier in the Wehrmacht was supposed to know how to drive. I had been given some idea of how to handle military vehicles during my training in Poland but on machines of a very different kind. However, as one never discussed orders, I jumped into the driver's seat of the Tatra. In front of me, the dashboard presented an array of dials whose needles uniformly pointed down, a few buttons, and a series of words in indecipherable characters. The engineers had just attached the heavy truck to the back of a Mark IV. We would be leaving instantly. It was essential that I get the wretched machine to start. I considered climbing out and confessing my incapacity, but repressed the idea on reflection that they might assign me to something more difficult, or even leave me behind, to get out on my own feet as best I could. If I couldn't move I would be captured by the Bolsheviks, a thought which terrified me. I pawed frantically at the dashboard and was blessed by a miracle. My desperate eye fell on Ernst, who was clearly looking for a lift. I felt saved. Ernst, I shouted. Over here, I've got room. My friend joyfully jumped aboard. I was ready to hang on to the back of a tank, he said. Thanks for the seat. Ernst, I asked in a voice of supplication. Do you know how these damned things work? You're a fine fellow sitting here when you don't know the first thing about it. I had no time to explain. The powerful engine of the tank to which we were attached was already roaring. Hurriedly, we pulled at the controls. From the turret, one of the tank men signaled to me to put the truck in gear at the same time as the tank, to reduce the jolt for the wounded. Nubach pulled a lever under the dashboard and we felt a responding throb from under the hood. I pressed down hard on the accelerator and the engine made a series of loud bangs. Gently, the Feld shouted at me. I smiled, nodded, and let up on the pedal. The chain stretched taut and we increased our speed. How fast were we going? I had no idea. I knew with certainty only that we were not in reverse. The heavy truck took off with a brusque jolt, producing a chorus of groans and curses behind me.